Welcome everyone. I am Laura. I am the manager of preservation and outreach at Friends. For over 30 years, almost 40, Friends has worked to preserve the architectural legacy, livability, and sense of place of the Upper East Side. Before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I'd like to ask you to please respond to a poll that I'm going to put on your screen right now. Um, yes. All right. Uh, something probably showed up on your screen. So if you could uh, respond to that, please. Um, Zachary Violet has a PhD in American and New England studies from Boston University. He's, he currently lectures at Parsons, the New School of Design in New York City, and is researching a follow-up volume for the wonderful The Decorated Tenement book you'll hear about today. So we hope that after the research and done, Zach will come back to do another book talk to us. Um, but now, Zach. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Let's get this screen sharing going before I start talking too much. Uh, are we, wait, oh, this poll is there. Sorry about that. And does this look good, Laura? Can we, are we good? Yes, we're good. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for that introduction. And I really appreciate the invitation to speak tonight and your setting all of this up. This is, as you might have just been able to tell, uh, my first real Zoom book talk. I've done more casual things than this. So I'm really excited to see how this goes. And I'm really excited to be speaking to the Friends of the Upper East Side. Because while the story that I tell in the decorated tenement is primarily based on the Lower East Side, uh, for much of the 19th century, the two neighborhoods formed what most people considered one large tenement neighborhood. And in fact, some of the most important characters in my story, particularly Peter Herder, uh, who I'll be talking about at various points tonight, got their start working for fellow German immigrant builders uh, in Yorkville. And really his first uh, project in America uh, was nearly a full block of buildings that looked just like this uh, on East 78th Street uh, and York Avenue. So the two neighborhoods and the two stories are really um, intertwined in important ways. And so tenements like the one that Herder designed for James Schnug in 1886 are intimately familiar to many of us. The very fabric of New York's residential landscape. But as I argue in the book, while there's been ample interest in them, especially at the community level, we haven't really fully come to terms with the significance of the buildings that are most familiar to us. The five to six story buildings built between the 1870s and the first decade of the 20th century. And in part because we've lacked the full context for understanding these buildings, they've often flown under the radar of what was thought worthy of scholarly attention uh, and historic preservation. But looking carefully at these buildings, uh, we can begin to shed light on the ways uh, in which immigrants helped to shape the housing standards of their own communities. And in doing so, we can begin to understand uh, underappreciated aspects of the creation of housing and urban space in the Gilded Age city. And a large part of the reason we haven't fully understood the significance of the 19th century tenement is because of a persistent narrative, really the master narrative on American housing. And it goes something like this. In the 19th century, uh, housing conditions were terrible, especially for the urban working class, as places like the Lower East Side uh, became overcrowded and existing housing stock could hardly uh, could hardly handle the new crowds. This rapidly deteriorated into horrific conditions that were summarily dismissed by outsiders, at least, as slums. And the landscapes produced that this economic disparity produced uh, became some of the most salient visual culture characteristics of the Gilded Age. Uh, images like Matthew Hale Smith's frequently reproduced uh, frontispiece of Sunshine and Shadow uh, in New York, or Jacob Rees's iconic work are some of the most famous 
manifestations of this. And so this story is undoubtedly true. And as the usual story goes, housing reformers, prominent citizens, many of them inspired by the muckraking of Jacob Greece and others, who had a genuine desire to ameliorate truly wretched conditions, intervened with new laws, most notably in 1879 and 1901, as well as model tenements, if only a limited number of these were built. And of course, um, Yorkville has some interesting examples that should be up there instead of um, these. Um, and this story is also true and led, and led to a number of important social innovations of the 20th century, like urban planning and public housing. Uh, these housing reformers laid the groundwork for the highly specialized, technocratic even, uh, culture of housing production and related fields of social science that mark much of the 20th century discourse on housing. And this is why people, scholars and housing activists have been so rightfully interested in it. So none of what I should, I'm going to say tonight should be taken to diminish the significance of the housing reform movement, which had considerable and important long-term effects. But what this master narrative leaves out is that there was a widespread culture of building improved tenements in places like the Lower East Side that was carried out almost exclusively by immigrant builders who were building buildings designed by immigrant architects who were closely attuned to the taste, desires, and aspirations of their immigrant working class tenants. Mon much of the squalid landscape that Reese and others reformers were concerned about were rapidly disappearing beginning in the mid 1880s and being replaced by substantial new buildings like these. Um, yet all of this was happening in spite of, indeed quite in opposition to the housing reform movement. And this, the salient, the most significant fact about these buildings is they were almost exclusively built by small scale, usually recent immigrant builders, Italians, Germans, Eastern European Jews, who had a, specific, who had a different idea of what multifamily housing meant as compared to the mostly upper class white middle, uh, white Anglo-Saxon housing reformers. And that informed the design of their new buildings. For these builders, building improved tenements was not philanthropy, but indeed a vibrant, highly profitable immigrant enterprise that was deeply engaged in the culture of growing enclaves. And a big part about what's significant about these buildings and why I call the book The Decorated Tenement was that these buildings looked a lot different than the sort of buildings elite housing reformers were promoting as model tenements. Um, and we can see the differing appearance of these buildings, a model, a model reformed tenement on the left, uh, a decorated tenement on the right. And in this, we can read many of the class and cultural conflicts at the heart of the Gilded Age city. The appearance of these buildings mattered. These, this appearance mattered to the people who created these buildings. And it tells us a lot about the ways in which their sponsors viewed their immigrant working class tenants. Of course, the most striking difference between these two buildings, built ex at exactly the same time for exactly the same type of tenants, only a few blocks away, is the facade. The reform tenement, designed by the prominent architect Ernest Flagg, was built by a socialite millionaire as a charity. Its, its facade is of austere glazed brick. The immigrant built tenement, on the other hand, is full of classical terracotta ornament and high relief. Uh, with tall sheet metal, uh, with a tall sheet metal cornice with gilded letters proudly announcing the builder, Harris Fine's name. The fact that Fine's building, full when it was built of tailors and other workers in the garment and construction industries, the fact that this was ornamented to at least a level equal to, if not perhaps higher than that of a middle class flat, was a profound achievement. Uh, one that touched on the betterment, the leveling forces of industrial production. And the improvement that was represented by buildings like this was more than skin deep. This particular building had dining rooms and uh, designated dining rooms and parlors, both cherished markers of gentility, as well as modern amenities like kitchens with hot water boilers and dumbwaiter access, full private bathrooms, the feature that was very new in that neighborhood in 1899 and not required by law. And in this building, residents entered through a frescoed and marble tiled lobby and ascended a marble treaded staircase. 
these improvements uh, were such that the urban working class could not have dreamed of even a generation before this building was built. But these sorts of buildings, buildings like the one Spine was building, was really antithetical to the sort of reform uh, that, house, that elite housing reformers were promoting, because they were promoting a reform not just of housing standards, but of morality, culture, and taste as well. And this is why housing reformers scarcely mention the decorated tenement, these improved buildings, and if they do, hardly ever in a positive light. Indeed, when they did see them, when they did notice them, they were harshly dismissive. Because to housing reformers, immigrant tenants at best needed to be kindly educated in proper tastes and living standards. This was a major impetus uh, for the construction of the re model reform tenement. Flourishes were not only, are not wanted any more than they can be afforded, the famous reform architect Grosner Adderby declared in 1906. Um, to him and those like him, the reform tenement was to serve a didactic role. So commercial tenements, good ones like fines, um, were meant to accommodate within the constraints of the urban land market, the taste, desires, and aspirations of the immigrant tenement. And this what tenant, and this was uh, highly problematic, highly threatening to the reformers uh, project, because they were fearing rightly that tenants who had choices would be tempted away. Tempted away particularly by buildings that gave them legible signs of modernity and respectability. Note Jacob Reese's quote here. The, model the owners of a block of model tenements uptown had just gotten their tenants comfortably settled and were indulging in the hopes of their redemption, the redemption of the tenants under proper management when a contractor ran up a row of skin tenements, shaky but fair to look at, with brownstone tenements and gugots. The result was to tempt a lot of well-housed tenants away. But of course, tenants showed little interest in being redeemed, less so if this redemption meant uh, that it came with such high-handed moralism. Those gugots reflected uh, familiar but previously inaccessible visible signs of modernity, fashionability, and agency. These flourishes were not only wanted, they could indeed be afforded because of the processes of industrialization that had compelled many of them to the city in the first place. So our usual reform-centric story uh, of housing in the American city privileges the interventions of the comfortable, the well-established American elites, while at the same time it ignores, uh, denigrates, and denies agency from those immigrants who were trying to improve the conditions of their own neighborhood, more or less from the bottom up. And so in our rush to see only immiseration in the tenement, we have missed an important story of betterment that these buildings represent. Indeed, their buildings, which have long been derided as, uh, indeed, their builders who have long been derided as skin builders, and that term will make more sense in a minute, have often been treated as the anonymous boogeyman of the real estate speculator. But as I argue in the book, Many of these dismissals were deeply intertwined with the xenophobia, the anti-Semitism, and the anti-urbanism that were fundamental to 19, late 19th century American culture. And so while we know quite a bit about the reformers and what they thought of these buildings, they wrote prodigiously. Um, and their narrative has become the standard narrative of what the tenement means. It's difficult but possible uh, to recover the agency of those uh, builders and architects to, that were building these kind of buildings to tease out their stories. And part of what I try to do in the book is to recover stories of people like Peter Herter, who I mentioned a minute ago. Um, Peter Herter and his three brothers were born and educated in Germany. Uh, and they were, the sort of most important, the pioneering designers of the decorated tenement of these sorts of buildings. Uh, and he knew that wealthy elite reformers and their architects like Ernest Flagg knew little about immigrant tastes, desires, and lifestyles, right? Uh, 
And so the disdain, uh, Herder was one of the few to call out the disdain people like, like Flagg had for tenement residents, right? He says that the model tenement would do well with, with some modifications for decency and cheerfulness. The model tenement would do well for the indigent or criminal. It's like buildings are like medicine. They may, you know, they may be good, but they're nasty to take, right? Uh, and this led Herder to conclude that elite reformers like Flagg um, conclude of them that the greatest enemies of the poor have often been their public friends. Herder, trained at the prestigious Bio Academy, uh, understood the tenement and its design in a fundamentally different way. Uh, Herder and people like him saw these buildings, and here I'm showing one of the only surviving buildings that was both designed by Peter Herder and built by him uh, on his own account, as not something that was foreign and problematic, but as a necessary part of the built, urban built environment that could be made desirable, that was not only necessary, but could be made desirable through sensitive um, design. So Herder's general, generally positive outlook on the tenement as a perhaps desirable part of urban life sharply contrasted to important strains of American thought in this moment. To many, the tenement, especially one occupied by the immigrant poor and working class, was a fundamental threat to American ideals, to sort of American notions of uh, exceptionalism. Indeed, the rise of the tenement landscape itself bore, bore upon key questions of American self-conception. No object seemed to more fully threaten cherished ideals of American culture and society than the tenement redolent with associations with the struggles of the old world, incompatible with the apparent spaciousness of the North American continent. continent multifamily housing to many well-established Americans seemed like an ominous and incomprehensibly foreign institution to be avoided at all costs. And part of the explanation for this can be found in the concept of the slum stereotype, what as urban historian Alan Main has called it. In the antebellum period, most, most of the urban working class was housed in converted structures from which the last remaining value was being instruct, extracted. Period observers were apt to call these sorts of buildings rookeries, dens, rude hovels, evocative of the language of the habitat of animals, not humans. Um, these were simply wildernesses to be recolonized, resettled by the respectable population. They were apart from the polite landscape. But as such, they were impermanent by nature. Critics of the slum could take solace in the expectation that landscapes like these, as bad as they were, would soon be swept away for something more respectable. Many assumed that commercial or industrial structures was structures would soon rise on the site of these slums as adjoining commercial districts expanded. But what, what started happening instead, beginning in the 1880s, were large, larger, more solid, more commodious buildings. Here in this iconic view uh, of the Hester Street Market, we can see uh, a newly designed, herder designed building clearly rising above its low rise surroundings. Soon this developed into, solid, to, into a solid fabric of new and commodious tenements on the site of the old slums. And in many ways, these buildings were feared precisely because of their generally good quality. They made these revitalized neighborhoods not only denser, uh, but essentially permanent, vitally necessary, and for many desirable part of the landscape. Even the New York Times in 1889, usually a steady purveyor of slum stereotypes, had changed its tune. Responding to the development of blocks like this, it extolled the quote, gratifying and wonderful transformation that had taken place on the Lower East Side in the previous decade. Uh, the district seemed quote, born anew, abounding everywhere with substantial and in some cases, in some instances, handsome new tenements, tenement houses, five and six stories tall with quarters that were comfortable and commodious. But to reformers, the permanence and intentionality of these buildings, even if they insisted they were flimsy, 
seem to in, embody widespread fears that highly visible signs of social, cultural, and economic difference, instead of being a fleeting condition, were now an immutable part of American urban life. So the often reproduced images of models created for the charity organization society's 1900 uh, tenement house ex 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 exhibition uh, of a scrappy east side block converted to a monolith of tall brick tenements, this seemed to underscore those fears. Um, Anti-tenement advocates whose rhetoric in many ways paralleled that of the contemporaneous uh, and actually closely related temperance movement often took on a peculiarly American sort of fanaticism in this regard uh, in their crusade against multifamily housing. Indeed, they often couch their argument in religious terms, seeing the tenement uh, as a treacherous deviation from a divinely inspired social order. Um, William B. Patterson, a leader in the Methodist Episcopal Church, was perhaps the most unabashed, suggesting with rhetorical flourish that the biblical murderer and city builder Cain himself was the originator of the tenement. Um, and Patterson plainly articulated an idea that was commonly held by many American Protestants, quote, the tenement is an impediment to God's plan for the home. No matter how safe, how commodious, or how decent such a building uh, could be made, he insisted, quote, this basic fact will remain. And Jacob Brees was perhaps even more fanatical in this, in his disdain for the tenement, proclaiming in 1889 that, a, quote, a shanty is better than a flat in a cheap tenement any day, even if he admitted, for instance, that the death rate was substantially lower in a modern tenement, uh, even a cheap one, as we see uh, rising behind this, Amer this uh, upper Manhattan squatters camp. But that statement certainly would have seemed fanatical to the residents of one of those new tenements going up in the 1880s or 1890s. These tenants had a whole host of things that many in the working class never had access to before. So just what was better about a shanty? Maybe air and light, but privacy for sure. Four walls and a roof for a single private family were held up by Reese and his ilk as a sacred right. But it would come at the cost of cosmopolitanism, fashionability, and even modernity itself. A shanty probably wouldn't have been more comfortable, certainly not more technologically advanced than a tenement flat, even a cheap one. Indeed, the tenements that were being built, uh, just as Jacob Rees was making that pronouncement, had been the beneficiaries of a consistent trend of improvement in working class housing that had taken place over the course of the 19th century. The evolution that took place, uh, that was witnessed in places like this Mott Street block, encoded a number of important innovations that improved the lives of working class tenants. They just weren't the sort of innovations that reformers were interested in. And so even in the comparison between these three plans, which have long been reproduced uh, to describe the increasingly exploitative nature of the urban tenement, we can see a substantial rise in working class housing standards. Um, indeed, representing the most common New York uh, tenement plan of their respective moments, the changes seen on this Mott Street block uh, were material manifestations of rising expectations of the working class uh, for their housing. Uh, and this was enabled not only by rising wealth, but the increased presence of builders with an interest and an incentive to provide better housing. So the oldest of three, these three buildings is the one at the center. Uh, standing at 65 Mott Street, this is, uh, it, this may have been built as early as 1824. And if so, it is likely to be the oldest purpose-built tenement in New York uh, and quite likely anywhere in the country. And it is just hanging on there down on Mott Street. Um, according to uh, historian Elizabeth Blackmar, buildings like this legitimated the poor housing conditions of the 19th century slum. Indeed, the small two-room apartments, uh, two-room units inside were typical of early working class housing, but at least it wasn't a converted 
uh, carved out of a rookery, and therein lay its innovation. And so buildings like Jacob uh, Weeks' tenement set the stand, set the basic spatial pattern for multifamily housing in New York for the rest of the century. It was dubbed a double-decker tenement, uh, a useful period term for buildings in which two families shared the frontage of a standard 25-foot lot, usually with another two across the rear, and in this case, uh, even a third unit in a back building at the rear. And you can instantly recognize the double-decker tenement by the pattern of four windows uh, across the front of a 25-foot facade. Uh, and usually if the middle two have a fire escape between them, that means it's also divided front and back. Uh, this is uh, almost universal. But Weeks, who was born in the Lower East Side, but followed the middle and upper class uptown through the course of the 19th century, would take on the role of the absentee slumlord, making few improvements of a building that he owned or his family owned well into the early 20th century. Um, he would flee uh, the changing neighborhood first to an elegant townhouse on Gramercy Park, and by the 1880s, uh, was living in a large brownstone on, uh, next to Cornelius Vanderbilt on Fifth Avenue. Meanwhile, uh, in the decades after the Civil War, we see an important, in, uh, important innovations that are represented by the building just to the north of Weeks. Built by Martin Fricken, a uh, German immigrant liquor dealer uh, in about 1875. Um, the building was substantially deeper than Weeks, uh, than Weeks building. And inside the four room units now contained an important amenity, a parlor, a place of modest but important uh, gentility that was separate from the workaday kitchen. There were now distinct places for living and cooking and for sleeping. Ficken would uh, provide a sink uh, with water to each floor, reducing the hassle of lugging water from the outside well. Uh, and as we can see, the facade is much fancier. And the new amenities and the new street facade didn't just help Ficken rent apartments. Uh, he moved into the building and lived there with scores of tenants for at least a decade after its completion. Um, in 1887, as a new wave of immigration began to swell the already crowded neighborhood, Barney Isaacs, a Polish Jewish cigar maker who lived nearby on Orchard Street, bought the two houses just to the south of the Weeks building. And he replaced what had been two-story uh, row houses with a pair of six-story elaborate buildings that were designed by Schneider and Herder, Peter Herder's brother. Um, the buildings were far advanced over Ficken's building of just over a decade earlier. Not only did the inner rooms have light thanks to the air shafts, each floor had two flush toilets, a great improvement over the unsanitary privies that had been in the backyard of the older tenements. Um, these were required by law, but plenty of other improvements were not. The kitchens uh, each had their own sink with running water uh, and sewer connection, and potentially a hot water boiler. They had a cooking range, uh, a dumbwaiter served each floor, the parlors were wallpapered uh, and provided with folding blinds and likely faux marble mantles as well. Yet these plans were routinely maligned by housing reformers as heedless, designed with no other goal in mind than to wring the maximum rent from tenants. Indeed, builders did, of course, have to keep an eye on what tenants would pay for and had to prove that these expensive innovations were popular. Doing so, however, meant that they were responding to rising expectations uh, by tenants for spatial and technological accommodations and aesthetic improvements, reflecting changing standards, preferences, and cultural practices. During times of rapid tenement construction, when there was a widespread overbuilding of these buildings, tenants could achieve better accommodations and frequently moved to achieve this goal. Indeed, because of the complexities of urban working class life uh, and tenants' complex economic strategies, such as taking in borders or doing uh, commercial work within the home, Builders knew that tenants preferred to have an increasingly complex suite of rooms for varying purposes, including parlors and eventually dining rooms, 
even if these rooms were smaller and more poorly lit than they would have been if undivided. Additionally, as life in many immigrant communities were lived largely on the street, as it had been in Europe, privacy was not so much an abiding concern. To the contrary, residents wanted the closest possible connection to the street, uh, ideally outside a formal parlor. Um, and this is the rationale, the, the commercial rationale for the double-decker tenement, because it allowed the maximum number of units to face onto the street. The, this increased demand for varied rooms and the need for a parlor close to the street uh, required these deeper footprints that pushed bedrooms and kitchens into darker, stuffier positions on the inside of the lot. And many tenants, builders like Ficken and Isaac understood, made this ten this trade-off readily. Um, even in the and again, this much much maligned insistence on building a building um, single buildings on 25 foot lots, even where space for a larger building was available, uh, as Ficken did with uh, as, excuse me, as Isaac did with his pair of tenements here, was an important design choice. It kept the tenant tenement an accessible investment uh, to small builders and later owners. Um, and so while the 25 foot wide double decker like these on Mott Street remained fixed in the pub as the public image uh, of the New York tenement, particularly as the reform uh, agitation grew that led up to the 1901 Tenement House Act, Construction of those kind of buildings actually dropped off dramatically after about 1892. By that point, they were increasingly supplanted by more commodious plans, usually now built on wider lots. Um, quite apart from reformers' claims, with the rising expectations of the 1890s, the inadequacies, inadequacies of these old plans to meet tenants' demands, particularly for dining rooms and full bathrooms, became increasingly apparent. These new ten tenements, and these are still old law tenements, um, began to break away from the rigid linear arrangement of those older models to accommodate features such as dining rooms, private halls, and full bathrooms. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, uh, builders of many of the best tenements in the neighborhoods uh, were providing a high level of amenity, including generous closets, private halls, in some cases even steam heat, uh, and in the case of the seven-story buildings, um, passenger elevators as well. Uh, this and a handful of other uh, buildings in the Lower East Side were built for an economically stable clientele, occupying uh, desirable locations within the neighborhood. While this was not, of course, the norm, uh, neither was it unusual for the high end of the tenement market just before the 1901 uh, reform law. Yet in these improved tenements, not even a commodious building like Henry Court, uh, met the provisions of the 1901 uh, Act, which required more generous light courts, reflecting one of the reformers' key preoccupations. Indeed, before this time, Reformers were, uh, few builders, few tenement builders were convinced that bigger courts were worth the sacrifice of accommodations. As the Building Trades publication, Real Estate Record and Guy and Builder's Guide noted in 1899 on the eve of the new law, quote, it may be taken that, larger air shaft, that the larger air shaft is an improvement, but not when its cost in living space and, ox, and the obstacles it presents to good planning are taken into account. And so, while the, uh, in, uh, well, the enactment of the new law in 1901 caused a temporary dip in the construction uh, of tenements on the Lower East Side, by 1903 and 1904, a boom had been going on. Uh, the, the boom that had been going on since the 1890s uh, resumed apace. And in many ways, the new law tenements were indistinguishable from the improved old law tenements of the 1890s, except for their gradual movement away from the 25-foot law, which, while not explicitly outlawed in 1901, was increasingly difficult to accommodate, especially to accommodate 
tenant's preference for outlook onto the street. And so that's why part of what I argue in the book is that we've given the 1901 law sort of outsized importance in our discussion of uh, housing uh, in New York. But some tenants, some, excuse me, some builders took the imprimatur of the new law to recast uh, their buildings as something different than they were before uh, and reclaimed uh, the reformers term model tenement. So here I'm showing two uh, plans from uh, the commercial architect, the prolific commercial architect, George Fred Pelham, um, who has taken the name uh, model tenement uh, and applied it to commercially uh, commercial uh, tenants, right? Built over the course of the preceding four years by the prominent uh, developer Charles I. Weinstein, uh, these buildings met all of the standards of the new law, but yet in the advertising copy that uh, appears in the uh, vanity publication, the apartment houses of the metropolis, um, Weinstein and Pelham uh, chose, to, chose to highlight the improvements of amenity and appearance, not air light and planning they wooed potential tenants with galvanized iron sinks and boilers in the kitchen, uh, with china cabinets in the dining room, with bronze mailboxes and annunciator bells in the marble lobby, uh, as well as fresco par frescoed parlors and mirrored mantles in each apartment. The hard-fought hard light and air did not register as a selling feature that Weinstein thought would particularly interest his tenants. And so this prioritizing of aesthetic and technological features suggested a strong engagement with the visual standards of contemporary architecture, signaling that the improvement of these buildings uh, meant far more than better amenities and a greater variety of rooms. Uh, the appearance of these buildings was important to Weinstein because it was important to his tenants. This search for an appropriate visual standard for the tenement facade had played out over the course of the 19th century, as we had seen, but in many ways mirrored what we see going on in the interior. Because tenement builders were responding to a working class taste that historian Elizabeth Cohen has noted uh, relished elaborate complex forms that appropriated long-standing symbols of power and status um, and to market and and cater to the demand for them right uh, before the middle of the 19th century these elaborate forms had essentially been had been understood as a signifier of wealth expensive to produce uh, they were a symbol of ample means and social status um, and so, and, and so their um, appropriation by not only tenement builders, but here we see the interior of a tenement room as furnished, as decorated by their tenants, suggested that there was a shared aesthetic standard between builder and architect, and that the builder was responding to exactly this kind of taste and this kind of taste that was allowed through industrial production. Um, and so this material culture allows us to understand these shared uh, aesthetics. And this is mostly seen, the people who were most responsible for providing these standards were most uh, prominently, most clearly uh, through the influence of German trained architects of which the herders were the best known, or at least the best documented, and probably among the most significant. Um, and it was Peter Herder's older brother, Henry, that first seemed to have taken an interest in the booming market for working class housing. Uh, in 1881, about a year after his arrival from Germany, uh, uh, Henry Herder became uh, a partner in the office of a fellow German-born architect, August H. Blankenstein. So his first tenant, his first tenant, the first building that he designed in New York is on the far left, a conservative building uh, built in 1885 for builder Solomon Jacobs. 
Uh, this was virtually indistinguishable from the work of other architects uh, in New York going back to the 1850s. Yet exactly the, later the same year, Herder designed the building in the middle, also for Jacobs. It had a far more richer and more elaborate facade. And Jacobs clearly uh, favored this new mode and seems to have embraced Herder's uh, aesthetic experimentation. A year later for another Eldred Street tenement for Jacobs, uh, Herder had uh, hit upon a more coherent facade arrangement uh, that was divided by colossal pilasters supported on oversized grotesque masks topped with terracotta capitals. Uh, there were robustly rendered female figures that graced the corbels flanking the door, and the building was capped by a tall pedimented cornice uh, of sheet metal. These built, and here I'm showing uh, the Jacobs tenement is extant but altered on Elgin Street. Here I'm showing another uh, Herder building that was nearly identical of the same moment. Um, these elements were highly evocative of. Uh, the influence of German architectural training. These are uh, drawn straight from, from German architectural theory. Um, and this pattern was quickly emulated. Um, uh, and with the success of this new model, Herder would soon leave Blankenstein and join with Ernst Schneider to form Schneider and Herder, who were the most prolific tenement architects uh, in New York in the late 19th century. And so while they may have been most, the most prolific, um, Henry Herder's brothers, Peter and Frank, are the best known today, thanks in large measure to this commission. Peter arrived in New York in 1884, and their youngest brother, Frank, arrived in 1885. And they soon began operating as Herder brothers, architects, unconcerned that they would be confused with the other more elite architectural firm of, of the more elite interior design firm uh, of Gustav and Christian Herder, unrelated. But perhaps this confusion served the architect brothers well, helping to establish themselves uh, among the immigrant elite. Indeed, the brothers were uh, prominent members of the uh, German immigrant community uh, at the time of their arrival. Um, so perhaps it's not surprising that in 1886, they um, received the commission for the Eldred Street Synagogue for one of the largest Orthodox Jewish congregations in the city. Uh, but this uh, commission, was clearly indicative of the esteem to which their uh, European training was held. The architects produced an ornate and loosely Moorish revival style building that reflected the tradition of the grandest such buildings on the continent, a product of an assertive, uh, uh, assertive projection of a Jewish identity uh, in a period of increasing economic freedom. But important for our purposes, Later in 1886, um, for a tenement on Broom Street for Wolf, Wolf Baum, uh, the architects employed the same moldings. Um, indeed, moldings seemed to that ha seemed to have been cast that seemed to have been uh, seemingly cast from the same mold as the Eldred Street Synagogue. They used the same buff brick that's since painted over here. Uh, the same foliate belt courses, window tiffin. Um, window tiffany and panels, each with a prominent star of David, surrounded by 12 spheres. Uh, and Blom's tenement was topped by a sheet metal cornice with a broad horseshoe-shaped pediment that set on polished red granite uh, columns that seemed to mirror the broad arch on the front of the synagogue and closely matched in moldings, proportions, uh, and other decorations, the walnut arc inside. Indeed, Herther Brothers' projection of a Jewish identity on these ten tenements was quite overt uh, because members of the synagogue building committee be were becoming important clients of Herder's and important promoters uh, of improved tenements. Um, indeed, in the first part of 1887, uh, as the walls of the synagogue were rising, the uh, the firm received a crush of commissions for new tenements just like bombs. This included for Sander Jamalowski, 
uh, a key member of the community and the president uh, of the Elder Street Synagogue at this moment, an important immigrant banker who built a near copy uh, of Baum's tenement on Henry Street in 1887. And by 1890, Herder, the Herder brothers had designed one or more tenement projects for every one of the Elder Street Synagogue building committee members. And I, I posit in the book that it's this group that really helps to establish the uh, economic viability uh, of such improved uh, buildings. But their choice to elaborate these facades the, um, is particularly noteworthy in context of the Central and Eastern European apartment house of this period. Facades with richly decorated with stucco, plaster, or cast stone ornament increasingly um, adorned facades uh, in, in rapidly expanding Berlin, where Herder was trained. Um, and these buildings, which are roughly contemporaneous with those in New York, share not only the propensity to overload facades with mechanically reproduced ornament, but also many of the same idiosyncrasies, and some would say naivete, in rendering those forms, suggesting a common source of design. The propensity towards facade ornamentation um, and its connection to the New York tenements is seen throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Vilna or Vilnius in modern Lithuania uh, pre presents a particularly interesting case. A large number of New York tenement builders originated in that city, perhaps more so than any other single place in the region. And in Vilnius, we find not only the stucco facades that are uh, typical in Berlin, but a more distinctive re regional facade type that is skewed stucco uh, in, in favor of a highly plastic facades of pressed brick, um, enlivened by a grid of piers and spandrels with terracotta uh, panels or cast stone uh, panels in the spandrels especially when they're rendered in buff brick, as this building on the left is, um, many of them, the similarities between the New York tenement are particularly noteworthy. Uh, and I show the, the West Side building on the right. Uh, the developer of that building, which was designed by Herder, uh, and this has lost its large elaborate cornice, like the ones we had seen on the previous buildings, had arrived from Vilna, uh, only a decade before he had commissioned this building. And so at the very least, we see in the streets of the Central and Eastern European city, an important precedent for the New York decorated tenement. It is clear at the very least that these builders and architects were employing familiar modes of gentility, urban decorum, and responsibility towards the streetscape. Uh, even if they were out of sync with the American mainstream, um, which viewed the tenement as something to be minimized, not elaborated. Um, and this is particularly noteworthy um, when we compare the work that somebody like Herder was doing to uh, examples of what the mainstream and elite real estate investment community was doing, not the reformers even, but the um, sort of workaday non-philanthropic housing. Um, their idea of the most rational business approach to the um, market for low-income housing is represented by the building on the left built in 1885, again, exactly contemporaneous with the buildings we're looking at, for the aid of A.B. Schumerhorn, one of the oldest uh, uh, families in this, and wealthiest families in the city. It was um, built to the minimal standards uh, of speculator built tenements. Indeed, um, unlike most tenements, however, this block was designed by one of the most elite architects in the country, George B. Post, a favorite of the city's wealthy and elite. So Prost's facade was among the most austere of any tenement built in that city. Um, and it's particularly noteworthy in comparison to an actual utilitarian building, um, the one on the right, 
uh, this was designed by Post the same year uh, for another member of the Schumerhorn family near the seaport. Uh, this loft was elaborated with terracotta window trim uh, and this elaborate shell-shaped cornice well, the, uh, with moldings and keystones that featured aquatic uh, motifs. This iconography, of course, signaled the seafood dealers that occupied the building. The ornament of uh, the Akimati Loft as a business building signaled the respectability of its commercial tenants with stylish terracotta forms. No such messages were required uh, on the East Third Street tenement uh, post and Krupshank uh, agent who uh, was responsible for it believed its working class tenants could only be properly housed in a utilitarian austere building fit for the purpose of making housing for making money and providing middle minimal shelter but little else so why does the story of the decorated tenement get lost largely i argue that in no small measure that was due to this man, or the builder of these buildings, Charles A. Budensike. To many reformers, he was the signal example of the greed and stupidity of the immigrant tenement builder. In April of 1885, a faulty mortar mixture uh, caused a five-story uh, tenement that he was building on West 61st Street to suddenly collapse causing seven others that he built to fall in domino-like fashion. The incident killed a worker uh, and injured several others, including Budensike himself, and it caused a media sensation um, in which the whole system in which housing uh, was created in New York was open to scrutiny. Budensike was a prolific builder, including on the east side, um, and tenements were said to spring up like mushrooms under his magic touch. And of his buildings, the New York Times complained, quote, all must have showy brownstone fronts and pretentious interior decorations, but all is cheap and wretched beyond description. And Budensike's manslaughter trial promoted near daily coverage in all of the city's major papers. Uh, blatant class prejudices permeated much of the, many of these accounts. The builder was said to speak in a, quote, unintelligible German accent and wear, quote, cheap, ill-fitting clothes. Numerous examples of corruption uh, were on display. The um, the city building inspector responsible for the failed 61st Street project was Henry J. Dudley, who had formerly been Budensike's in-house architect and the man who designed the uh, 3rd Street buildings I'm showing here. Uh, Dudley was accused of taking bribes to overlook shoddy workmanship. Uh, and key witnesses in the trial, uh, including the failed buildings architect, were absent uh, in defiance of a subpoena. Uh, in Budensike's defense, he claimed that since he was a butcher by trade, he knew little about building and relied on his architect, his foreman in the building department, uh, to assure that his projects were properly executed. Convicted, he spent six years in Sing Sing before being pardoned. But the incident would cast a long shadow over the whole field of tenement production. The, his name, the word Budensike, for decades was synonymous with greed and tottering walls. He was impugned as a skin builder, someone who built, built good looking buildings just strong enough to hold together until a buyer could be found. The image of the skin builder with his good looking but flimsy Budensike structure played a central role in the expansion of the slum stereotype that I talked about a, a minute ago into the landscape of the improved decorated tenement. And subsequent uh, collapses on tenement building sites like this one at Mat um, Madison and Rutgers Street just seem to prove that these buildings were shaky despite reformers best efforts. Uh, and indeed, these claims in particular uh, helped to further uh, reformers claims to control of the landscapes and the people who uh, built them. Still, the cycle of construction 
uh, of increasingly improved tenements on the Lower East Side and elsewhere in the city's working class neighborhoods, uh, at least of Lower Manhattan, continued until about 1905, really until the panic of 1907. By that point, better transportation options and rising wealth had prompted a major shift in the focus of construction of new working class housing to peripheral areas like Washington Heights and the South Bronx. Um, and many of the builders who had previously worked on improved tenements downtown increasingly became interested in these um, areas. Um, and that in the end is the um, next book. <laughs> That's uh, the, the research that I'm working on now. Uh, and because this story really continues through the 1930s uh, in places like the Eastern Parkway, the Grand Concourse, uh, the, the builders and architects, they really belied uh, their roots in the tenements of nearly a few decades earlier. Um, and, and this really helps to highlight the, the importance of the long maligned and overlooked uh decorated tenement of the gilded age in new york thank you so much well thank you zach um i think you have uh responded one of my first questions already but before <laughs> we go to q a i'd like to ask people to turn their videos on and uh would like to see your faces and we can start um uh, uh, Q and A, and let me just also allow participants to unmute yourselves. Uh, so, if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand. And I'm going to start uh, with a question that came from Franny here, um, and it's how how did you get into this? Like, why? What led to this book? And we'll let you hear. It was a a project that had a long evolution, right? It started, it's actually started in Boston in grad school, uh, noticing it really, and it really started in the north end of Boston, which is the tenement district, sort of much like, experienced much of the same things that happened on the Lower East Side. And I was just noticing, I, I had the preconceived, I sort of understood the standard story of the tenement, and I understood that neighborhood to be a tenement neighborhood. And I've always been interested in ornament. And so the, the, in my first walks through that neighborhood, I, I just came upon building after building that was far more elaborate, uh, fancy, more fanciful than I had anticipated. And it's like, there's a story here, right? There's a reason these buildings look the way they do. And I, I, none, nothing that I read, none of the stories of how these neighborhoods came to be answered the question of why those buildings looked the way they did. So the whole long project was uh, trying to answer that question. Eventually it became clear that really it's a New York story that Boston was peripheral to. So eventually it came to, um, it came to encompass both cities. Interesting, very interesting. And the question that I had that um, I said you answer was, what was the next book about? What, what, what's left to, it was such a thorough uh, presentation, and it seems to be a very thorough book. I was wondering what's left. Well, so the initial project, what I had always wanted to do is carry the story from the Civil War to the Great Depression, right? And so the book that the Decorated Tenement does from the Civil War until about 1900, 1905, right? Um, because there is this big shift, this movement to the peripheral, not exactly the suburbs, but to the peripheral neighborhoods in this point. And there's um, interesting things that are going on in this period. Basically, the tenement is melding with the apartment house, and the apartment house itself and the tenement uh, both become more accepted. So the next book is really about the acceptance of the apartment house from a large demographic, not just the working class, but the middle class as well in the first three decades of the 20th century. So I'm looking at places like Washington Heights, Inwood, then uh, uh, the South Bronx, Grand Concourse, Flatbush, these neighborhoods. And the interesting thing is you then start to see those buildings in not only cities that had tenements, but places like 
Detroit and Atlanta and Los Angeles. And so it becomes a national story. And the question is, how much does New York influence, uh, influence those places? So um, that book is coming along. Um, so. Right. Um, do we have, uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself or submit it in the chat. Um, I also sent it in the chat, uh, the link to purchase the book. Um, so I'm just going to give people a little time um, to see if they if some questions. I, can, I, I feel like you were I so... Can, I can wave the... the oh, I actually can't wave the book because that goes off on the, the background, but there's the book there. <laughs> um, I, I think that you have been so thorough that it, it that, doesn't leave room have, for... Uh, well, you know, sometimes you don't want to suck all the air out of your room, but uh, you know, there's, uh, oh, sometimes you you feel like you, you, you go through with nobody putting you on the hot seat. So <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to answer anything now, or if anybody wants to shoot me uh, an email, uh, I'm happy to, to talk more about this uh, with anybody okay. else. Well, that sounds great. Uh, I think we've passed a little bit over an hour now, and yep. since it doesn't look like we have uh, any questions, I will, oh, uh, we do have a question. So uh, someone sent a question asking if you have uh, investigated more builders and their architects on the Upper East Side, like Pelham. Um, so the field work, the building by building documentation I did was on things below 14th Street. So everything on the Upper East Side uh, I've done was circumstantial where I sort of saw things coming in and out. I did a lot of work on Pelham. Uh, he's actually one of the figures that's coming up in both, uh, in both projects. He did a lot of tenements and then he did a lot of apartment buildings straight through the thirties. Um, uh, from what, from my sense of it is that there is a fairly, whenever I looked at a building uptown, it resonated in a lot of ways with what I was seeing downtown. There's a lot of the same architects, a lot of the same builders. Um, what was interesting when one of the points I make in the book and the, the, the building that I show in my first slide, uh, it was a simpler version of it, that there is, there's more ornament downtown. Not exclusively, and I think your 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 Zoom background proves that it's uh, that that's not exclusively true. But that that there is a, a simplicity of the uptown tenements that wasn't quite the the downtown ones were striving in a little bit more, and I play around in the the book a little bit on why that that might be. But it's, all right, I, it's, I think is, some, is somebody raising their their hand there? What? Or? Oh, sorry. Oh. I thought I saw somebody physically raising their hand. Um, oh, no. Somebody. All right. So I think, oh, well, thank you, Zach. Thank yep, you for my, this wonderful talk and good luck pleasure. with book two. Let us right. know when it's out. Would love to do I, this I will, again. It, it will be on your radar. Yeah. And if anyone has any follow up questions, just shoot me an email. I'll follow them to Zach. And also, if you'd like to purchase the book, I send the the link in the chat, but I'd be happy to send it again to you. Thank right. you for coming, everyone. Have right. a great Thank night. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. Bye-bye.